We're live. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to the members of the Police Accountability and Reform Work Group, and good afternoon to everyone who is uh, joining us, whether you're watching us or listening. Today is the fifth meeting of the work group that was created by Speaker Jones and, Jer Clip and Chair Clippinger in May to address police reform and accountability in the state of Maryland after the murder of George Floyd. Uh, the work group creation was not a response to that murder. The work group was accelerated, I would say, because of everything that was going on at the time nationally. But prior to that, the speaker and the chair had been committed to creating this work group. The following members of the House of Delegates were assigned to the work group and have participated in its meetings. Myself, Delegate Vanessa Atterbury as chair, Speaker Pro Tem Cherie Sample Hughes, Minority Whip Kathy Schlega, Assistant Majority Leader Juanika Fisher, Vice Chair of Appropriations Michael Jackson, the, caucus, the Chair of the Black Caucus Daryl Barnes, the Criminal Justice Subcommittee Chair David Moon, Gover Government Operations Subcommittee Chair Sandy Rosenberg, Delegate Gabe Acevedo, Delegate Kurt Anderson, Delegate Jason Buckle, Delegate Deborah Davis, Delegate Mike Malone, and Delegate Susan McComas. And I would like to thank all of you for your time and commitment to this work group. The specific charge of the work group was as follows. One, to review policies and procedures related to the investigations of police misconduct, including Maryland Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights statute. Two, to determine the viability of uniform statewide use of force policies and arrest procedures. Three, to review the use of body cameras and disclosure of body camera footage. And four, identify national best practices of independent prosecution of law enforcement related crimes. To date, the work group has met for over 14 hours, been briefed on various topics related to police reform and accountability, including best practices and the current state of policing in Maryland. The work group held a, an approximately five and a half hour public hearing where we heard from over 90 members uh, of the public from across the street who told their very personal stories related to their, their police interactions or police interactions uh, with loved ones. We've heard from the community. We've heard from law enforcement. We know that Maryland is no different than the rest of the country and we need sweeping police reform and we need it now. Our citizens are demanding it and our citizens deserve it. And this work group is gonna accomplish just that. Today begins the work group's deliberations on recommendations to be proposed to the speaker for the 2021 legislative session. I have had the opportunity to speak with the majority of the work group members to ascertain what issues are individually um, important to them. I have put those topics uh, and you can see them, work group members, I have listed those topics. And the topics that came out in the conversation, in my individual conversations, and that will be a framework for our conversation as a larger group today, um, are accountability, body cameras, community oversight, decertification, independent investigations, independent prosecutions, mental health, police discipline, recruitment, training, and use of force. So what I would like to do is keep police discipline. Uh, we're going to keep that for the end of our conversation, maybe the last 30 minutes of our conversation. And um, let's start our conversation um, with, with, I want to open it up for accountabilities or body cameras. And I would like uh, members of the work group to give me your thoughts on on those two issues and this is going to be a conversation with all of the members so not 
to, you know, pick on anybody, but Delegate Anderson, I'm going to, I'm going to pick on you to have you start the conversation. So if Delegate Anderson could be unmuted. Um, and you presented some, some bold recommendations. Um, when we had our conversation, you can begin with those recommendations, uh, if you like, or what would you like to share with the work group? Well, I'm going to go along with, um, your agenda here. And, okay. um, uh, the first thing I had listed on my uh, uh, recommendations uh, dealt with discipline, but you just said that uh, we're going to do uh, disciplinary actions later. Yes. I just want to note for the record that um, currently under the state personnel uh, uh, annotated code of Maryland, Title 11, deals with uh, discipline, disciplinary actions, and um, it's quite detailed as to the uh, uh, due process rights that every every state employee has. But getting back to uh, your list, let me go over uh, the um, the idea that the investigations for uh, uh, situations where police are involved in seriously bodily harm or the death of uh, citizens of the state of Maryland, um, I thought it was appropriate to create a totally independent a unit uh, within the office of the attorney general that investigates, you know, where indicated um, and prosecutes uh, uh, situations involving homicides in cases of seriously bodily harm. Uh, when we had the ACLU on about 20, they said about 20 people a year die uh, after being, uh, after having encountered police in Maryland, that's 20 people a year. And that, um, uh, we ought to have some agency or some investigatory body look into this independent of the state's attorney, independent of that particular jur jurisdiction's uh, police force. And uh, looking at the office of the attorney general, I think that is best equipped uh, to handle it with uh, a very small additional infusion of money for, the, uh, for that office. Um, a fiscal analysis shows that um, three attorneys, three new attorneys, and as well as five investigators uh, would probably cost a little less than a million dollars a year. And the, um, the suggestion from the Office of the Public Defender back in our September the 17th meeting um, is, is a good one. And that is that uh, these investigators be hired from the ranks of, of police uh, murder detectives who have done this in the past and who have um, uh, perhaps are, are looking towards retirement. So my first suggestion there is to have a completely independent uh, body, the, um, the Office of the Attorney General with a separate unit in that office that does only this, investigates okay. situations with police officers uh, uh, charged or accused of, of seriously bodily harm or murder to other uh, folks. Did you wanna interrupt me? I'm sorry. No, I'm, no, go ahead. Okay, all right. Uh, secondly, um, I think everybody in the task force agrees, including the, uh, the memo that we got uh, yesterday or the day before from the, the sheriffs and chiefs, that um, all police agencies, every single police agency in the state should equip their patrol officers uh, with body-worn cameras. Uh, we can then instruct the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission to implement protocols uh, for when the cameras are to be turned on and off, uh, how much time the data from the cameras to be stored, and who has access to that data. There are currently models of how this should be done already in Maryland, uh, with Baltimore Police, the uh, Montgomery County Police, Howard County, and uh, Prince George's County Police all have different ways right now as to uh, when the cameras are turned on and off, how long the data is stored, who has access to that data, how the public gets access to that data. So I think that uh, the right now, unless we want to set up a small subgroup uh, to deal with specifics as to how the data is distributed, um, it probably may be left better to uh, the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission, um, which includes, by the way, civilian members as well as uh, police officers who do this every day. Um, the use of force standard. 
is not, I think, not just a statewide use of force standard is necessary. We need a statewide use of force statute, something that's in the law uh, that says this is the bright line of what we do as police officers and what we don't do so that it's clear that it's not just a suggestion. It's not just something that you should do if you can, if it's unavoidable. This is the bright line standard. And I'd like to point to uh, the standard that exists now uh, within the Baltimore City Police Department. Uh, it's an 11 page document. Uh, you can get it online. I, I think last time we, we uh, spoke, I gave you a link to it. But basically, um, the Baltimore City Use of Force Standard res is a result of uh, nationwide best practices suggestions uh, with input from the United States Department of Justice, uh, the United States District Court, uh, the Baltimore Police Department, the Baltimore Police FOP Lodge, and of course, many, many um, uh, community organizations. It's, um, it, it, it has detailed parameters for the use of force, definitions of deadly force, including chokeholds, choke and the duty to intervene and, and de-escalation. And again, those listening can go to, to uh, baltimorepolice.org slash 1115-use-force. Um, or you could just Google Baltimore Police Use of Force if you want to see the entire 11-page document. Kurt, um, I will just... Delegate Anderson, excuse me, interrupt you just for two seconds, just to say that everybody in the work group should, should have received that link with that oh, okay. document. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, my, uh, the next one on my list was um, something that we tried to get done in 2016 and uh, didn't have the votes to do it. I think we probably have the votes this time. And that is to uh, require periodic mental health evaluations or mental health assessments, whatever the terminology is that we want to use, uh, an evaluation is slightly different than an assessment. An evaluation gives you an idea as to where the officer is. An assessment probably gives you a better idea as to what needs to be done in order to get him to where he is. But they should be periodic. Right now, uh, the only requirements are that a person have a mental health evaluation uh, first coming onto the job as a police officer, you have to you know, pass your mental health evaluation. And then in many jurisdictions, uh, you have an evaluation after some traumatic incident occurs that you are a witness to um, or that you were involved in. Uh, and some of those may occur on a regular basis, but in many cases, uh, most officers don't have the ability or the benefit of a mental health evaluation uh, on a regular basis, like once every two years, once every three years. I think the period of time uh, we could decide upon after having talked with uh, mental health professionals uh, in, in, the, in, the, um, in the area. I mean, we require police officers to qualify every year with their handgun. Uh, so I think that we also want to be able to make sure that uh, their mental health is, status is good as well, uh, since these officers are carrying guns. Um, one of the things I thought was extremely important was the increase in minority recruitment for the police departments across the state. Uh, a lot of times you hear that, uh, well, we couldn't find enough African-Americans or we couldn't find enough Hispanics. Um, the, the pool just isn't there. So to that end, I uh, talked with the president of uh, Morgan State University um, which has a very um, robust ROTC program, Reserve Officers Training Corps, where students will get scholarships to go to college. And then after college is over, they're committed to being in the United States military for two to four years. Um, thousands of African-American students I know at, at, student, at, at, at um, colleges throughout Maryland do this every year and um, at least hundreds every year, thousands have graduated. And we could do the same for uh, students who were interested in becoming and going into uh, police work after this is over. Um, they would, you know, any, uh, any college, whether it's an African-American school, HBCU, or whether it's the University of Maryland, 
that offers a course in criminology, a course in um, um, you know any courses related to uh, policing that exists, uh, you know, uh, criminal justice. And um, if they decide to accept the scholarship, then they would also have to be uh, have to commit to uh, going into an academy at a police department and serving at a police department for a couple of years. Uh, again, the period of time we could decide uh, in this work group, but the idea is to A, encourage uh, uh, or, or, or create a larger pool of applicants for these police departments to choose from. And I'm quite sure that if you have an African American, uh, an Asian, Hispanic, or a woman who has gone through these courses already and it shows a willingness to want to go, then we'll. Uh, uh, these police departments would likely hire them, and uh, unless we mandate them to hire, but I'm pretty sure they'll they'll do it on their own. Um, finally, um, uh, I think in, in accordance with your list, uh, we ought to establish an ongoing mechanism to evaluate uh, community uh, uh, community satisfactions satisfaction with the um, uh, the community uh, work that the police departments are doing. Uh, Two universities I know already do assessments uh, of police departments, uh, do assessments through the community. In other words, they go to the community members, they do questionnaires, they talk to people, find out what the community thinks is working in the police department, what isn't. They return that assessment to the police department and the police departments have made uh, changes as a result of that. So um, um, that, Plus, uh, the police academy training is already mandated to include community policing courses, but in many cases, they're taught by police personnel. And uh, Morgan, again, Morgan State University School of Social Work has a cultural and community foundations policy, policing program where they have already trained three to 400 police officers and cadets in the Baltimore City Police Department uh, in uh, cultural and community policing. And you know, the police officers come to the school, it's eight to 16 credit hours, usually about two days, uh, but they have people in the uh, School of Social Work that actually have done this around the country and they're doing it for Baltimore City. Uh, we need to specifically say in our request for community policing that cultural community policing policies be included and not necessarily taught by police personnel. So that's that's all I got. Okay, thank you, Delegate Anderson. <clears throat> um, next, I since I, I don't have any volunteers uh, next to give your thoughts, I'm going to call on Delegate Moon. Hey, <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair. Well, I'm glad you called on me. I was just taking a bunch of notes. Um, I got. I have to say, uh, the one of these, and we could, we're going to agree on a lot of these, I think. But the one that really jumps out at me that's worth some thought is the first one, which is accountability, um, because I will remind everyone that we did a round of discussions on um, police accountability and reform after the Freddie Gray uh, incident, and it was a structure that didn't have any way of backing up its implementation, tracking its implementation. Um, so whatever the rules were that were created a few years ago, um, here we are now three, four years later, and we can't hardly tell anything about how it's working. So I am keen to, to make sure we don't fall into the same trap. So let me just um, frame this a bit. We've been housing a lot of the uh, it's rules and standards here with the Police Standards and Training Commission. Um, I had asked early on whether, and that's the law enforcement community itself, for the most part, um, self-regulating that they've had um, legislators uh, on there, some on this group, but for the most part, it's the police self-regulating. So I had asked early if it was the right place for that. And if we continue to think it's the right place for the rulemaking, I would suggest a few things. Um, we need to uh, be specific about what rules and parameters we're trying to put in front of them. We need to track if the local 
police departments are actually implementing those rules at all. Um, we need reporting requirements and standards so that we can measure the success of those implementations. And then after that, I think there are some decisions we need to make. Um, how do we actually uh, compel departments to adopt these standards and to do it successfully? Um, my theory of the case would be we need to tie funding in some way um, to that. And then at the individual department level, um, there still remains a question. What happens when an individual officer within a department that's supposed to be following these rules departs from those rules? That's obviously a big um, topic, but uh, I will say it's focused mainly on uh, administrative discipline for the officer and the prospect of criminal charges. But I'd like to uh, suggest that we introduce a third angle here, and that's what happens in the courtroom. Um, we've spent a lot of time talking about what happens in the police department, but I think what happens in the courtroom is just as important. And in some instances, um, an officer disabling or, um, you know, uh, misusing a body camera, for example, um, I, I would suggest that there's evidence exclusion and rebuttable presumptions um, that might come in. So let me summarize again, I guess, the thing that's at the top of my mind. Um, how do we put our input into the new rules, track that they're actually being um, implemented by local departments, and then creating reporting standards to track the success of that implementation between departments? How do we compel the local departments to actually adopt those standards, probably funding? And what happens when an individual officer um, violates those policies that we set? I don't want to be silent on any of those five um, factors uh, as we set these rules up, because I think though that's the glue um, that makes sure uh, something is actually changing in the world. Um, the other one I want to uh, quickly touch on um, is with the body cameras. Obviously, um, I, I've been in the camp that we need to require them um, and that we shouldn't be silent on creating standards for them. Again, last time around, we had the um, Police Standards and Training Commission mostly create um, self-regulation uh, standards for body cams. And I would suggest with um, the data we have now and the experience um, that we, again, we can be a little bit more specific. So questions I would offer, and you guys probably know how I feel on this. Um, obviously, uh, when it's turned on and who gets access to the footage has been much debated. But I will, uh, again, point to two additional topics that I think are very important. Um, we have left questions like how much uh, time the body cams pre-record footage, um, that has been left to local police departments. And I think decisions like that we need to think about. Um, what that means is the way body cams work uh, they are always running. So they're always recording some um, amount of time. And when an officer hits the button, it's directing the camera to start saving uh, everything from some designated amount of time. That might be 30 seconds in some police departments. But as we've seen um, in Baltimore, for example, that 30 seconds is what led to um, footage being captured of officers appear appearing to plant drug evidence. So um, that number, 30 seconds, whether it's a minute, two minutes that gets pre-recorded before the officer hits the button, is a subject of public interest that I think th these kinds of details, we should be specific this time. Um, and it leads to that other question. What happens if these um, cameras are not used or misused? There has to be some um, incentive or disincentive in the courtroom, I think. Um, lastly, uh, mental health and use of force. Um, to me, these are often intertwined topics. Um, the use of force, I th I'm going to throw in for we need a statewide standard that requires de-escalation, exhausting all resources, and deauthorizes um, lethal force in a range of circumstances like misdemeanors and things like that. Um, and for uh, mental health, to me, that's the, the big um, elephant in the room here. You know, hopefully we can get some consensus on agreeing that the police, armed police officers 
are not the best people to send to every circumstance. Let's figure out what those are um, and make a change. So that's my two cents. Thank you. Delegate Moon, could you, thank you for that. Your five things that you started out with. Yeah, so we're gonna, I think we need to be very specific about the rules we direct um, be created this time. Like last time we had them create body cam rules, for example. Mm -hmm. I think we need to be way more specific. Um, so I, I think as we hit each of these points, I don't wanna just leave it to the police to come up with something and come back to us later. We should just tell them the things we feel strongly about and put it in there. Um, the other is we need some way of tracking which of the local police departments implement said rules. And we need a way to compel them to do that. And I think it's gonna be through tying funding um, probably in some way to successful implementation of these statewide rules. Um, the other ones I put on here are um, once we have these rules, once we're insured they're, we ensure they're being implemented, we need to set up some standard for reporting the results of these rules. Like just on um, police traffic stops and race uh, or use of SWAT teams or um, police shootings. We've had wildly divergent ways police departments report things. I mean, unfounded rapes, right? Um, they just label that completely different in different Maryland counties. So I think where appropriate, we should try to um, put clarity on exactly what data we want reported throughout all of this to make sure there's accountability and that we are able to um, say we did more than tell the police to create body cam rules. We can say this many departments have successfully implemented it, this, how, this many haven't, here's what it's looking like, here's how many um, you know, misconduct cases were closed, that, that sort of thing. Um, and then the, the big one, number five, what happens when individual officers violate these policies? I, I think that's been you know, another one that we leave to the administrative discipline process, but I think there's a lot more to it than that, um, as I'm suggesting, courtroom, uh, courtroom, criminal, um, and administrative. It's really three tracks. Okay. Thank you, Delegate Moon, for sharing your thoughts on that. Uh, I am going to next move to Delegate Jackson. I know you're on um, the phone. I don't think you have video, but are you there, Delegate Jackson? I, because accountability, when we spoke, uh, was big for you as well. So do you want to comment on that? Um, yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I, I apologize for not being able to be on camera today uh, due to my work, but um, accountability is, is, is huge for me. Just a, a brief backdrop. Um, um, I, I think in our conversation, so from accountability standpoint, I think we need to uh, revisit the Police Training Standards Commission. Um, uh, our first presentation by the now uh, executive director and the president uh, or the chair, um, you know, it was stipulated a number of times, and I know this for a fact uh, in my previous life, that um, the training commission is just that. I think we need to create a regulatory commission, uh, or I'm sorry, we need to um, um, we need to have the Police Training Standards Commission become a regulatory commission. Uh, otherwise, there is zero teeth, regardless of what we put in place. We're going to continue to get the same the same answer uh, with uh, annual reports. Uh, we have some annual reporting that we have them uh, submit to us each year, whether it's SWAT or, or uh, traffic stops or some other uh, instances. So I think that's where the accountability has to start. And, and with that, we can create the uniformity uh, working in conjunction with them uh, as we are uh, aware or should be aware. Uh, 2016's legislation brought, uh, added four legislators. Uh, so that's where our teeth come in uh, to ensure that they are adhering to what we need for them to adhere to. Uh, and, uh, and also, so that everyone understands, there's also four civilians on, on that. I think it's four, I'm not sure, maybe five, Kurt, um, Delegate Anderson. Um, so um, regulatory commission uh, is a step in that uh, direction. 
to bring about accountability, um, to bring about uniformity um, as we move forward. Uh, with the body cameras, as been mentioned before, uh, agencies have different regulations. Uh, again, it goes back to making sure we have a uniform uh, policy in place for the state of Maryland uh, that all the agencies must adhere to. Um, use of force, uh, definitely we need, definitely uh, need it uh, to have a statewide um, uh, use of force uh, policy. Uh, within the trainings, uh, so we all understand, the agencies have uh, the training commission. Um, there is documentation on a de-escalation training process for all agencies. Um, by having the training and standards commission become a regulatory commission, uh, agencies would no longer have an out, i.e., I don't have enough staff. We don't have enough folks to train. Uh, De-escalation training is paramount uh, uh, moving forward. Uh, and our input on that training, uh, on that commission, as well as what we established in legislation uh, will help us to ensure that we have uh, those uniform, um, those things that we desire. And lastly, let me say this, um, as far as recruitment goes, I, mean, I ran an agency in a county of almost a million people, um, and we had no problems hiring diverse members. Uh, that is a desire uh, by the leadership of those agencies. Uh, so I don't, I, I do not buy that um, uh, one bit. Whether it's male, female, um, uh, black, white, red, yellow, or brown, uh, there are plenty of folks who would love to join this profession. Um, but it starts with leadership, and we just have to demand that. And I'm sorry, it's not the last. Uh, Madam Chair, for trial boards. Again, we need to make sure that the agencies are advertising uh, the fact that civilian participation on trial boards um, um, uh, is, is possible. Uh, right now it goes to um, their publication that only folks that are in the public safety arena are aware of. Uh, so we need to make sure that that, uh, that information is put out and 2016, we worked on the mental health piece with law enforcement officers for the, the assessment phase for them, periodic assessment phase. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Delegate Anderson. Uh, I think that we're in the, the proper posture to ensure that that takes place uh, because you know, the public deserves to have service uh, from those who, are, have, who have the capacity uh, to serve them. Uh, but accountability starts at the regulatory commission, which we set in legislation through Annapolis and we sit on um, that commission. So that's where we start. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, Vice Chair Jackson. Um, Delegate Fisher. Hi, Madam Chair, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, I appreciate all of my colleagues' comments. I pretty much um, agree with many of them. Uh, specifically with Delegate Moon's um, comments on making sure we create that accountability and um, Delegate Anderson's comments on um, creating an actual use of force statute that our prosecutors um, can use and that there's a standard um, language of use of force. I know that um, Delegate Davis and um, Delegate Washington, Alonzo Washington, um, both proposed um, different use of force statutes um, last year. I will start, let me start with my base and then I'll, I'll go and then you can cut me off, Madam Chair, when you think is appropriate. <laughs> okay. Okay, so one of the main things that concerns me that seems very administrative, but critical when it comes to our localities and us as a state in analyzing our departments is mandatory or mandating, mandating record keeping. It astonishes me throughout the various departments we have throughout the state, their, their accounts of use of force, the record keeping and the filing. And I understand that we have small municipalities out there that have you know five officers, whatever have you, they need to keep records that we can go towards. It's very, very frustrating um, with that. I think a conversation may have to occur um, with you, uh, Vice Chairman um, Jackson and appropriations on the actual money and an actual, I don't know if a statewide system of record keeping would be prudent, but I do think that it is crazy that 
these departments basically, you can't even begin to have accountability or see where you are without record keeping. So that's the, that's like my floor thing. The other thing is I've been really thinking about what the public expects and what I expect when it comes to death and bodily injury, because it's not just, you know, the 20 people we lose, um, a year, you know, that, that actually died at the hands of police. It's also, um, the pocket of serious bodily injury and the amount of taxpayer money that is going out um, to pay out these settlements. And I think you really have to look at the LEOBR and dismantle it. When I was going through, um, and I'm still weeding through the statute as a whole, I mean, even just in 31-04 under investigation, um, it's so vague on who an appropriate person is when it comes to the actual notice of an investigation. I mean, the statute of limitations that's given when it comes to misconduct in office, um, that you only have that year to report. Um, and what's interesting as well is that the LEOVR actually prevents us creating a standardized time frame on investigations. So let's say, you know, I, I'm, you know, I have a bad interaction with law enforcement. I've, I've received body injury, injury or a loved one is, is, is dead. There is nothing in our law that says that that investigation has to be done within 90 days. Nothing. There is nothing that gives the public a sense, no matter where they live, throughout Maryland, um, that their case and that their issue is going to be handled in an appropriate way. And a lot of that has to deal with the LEOBR, the requires the requirements around notice, um, the fact that you only give um, the other person the full investigation 10 days before a hearing is even um, booked, and a hearing can be booked at any time. There's no qualification on time when the hearing's actually booked. I think it's very, very problematic um, for us, and I would implore um, this committee um, to take a serious, serious look. The other thing that I wanted to talk about um, was um, independent investigations, which I think are are critical. I did not agree with, with everything that we heard um, throughout our presentations, but one thing I can highlight that I do agree with is I don't think a body should be investigating itself. And then that's the evidence that's used whether it's in a, in a in a criminal setting with the grand jury or in the um, departmental internal affairs setting, when it comes to um, the uh, what's it called the word I forgot the word now, but like the punishment or the ramifications within the department, um, I really think that I agree with um, um, Delegate Anderson about um, creating a body that does these um, that does these. Um, uh, definitely for serious bodily injury and for death, um, an independent investigation. And I think we have to help unchain our localities. Um, and that comes with the LEOBR as well, and to allow them, if they would like, to have a more robust in independent investigation for any type of complaint, right? Sexual assault, he called me the N-word, you know, I've had in my own district, I had an undocumented woman raped by a police officer, right? So, it's not just the death and serious bodily injury, but you know, I'm also an understanding of like political bandwidth. Um, and I think we also want to make sure we can unchain our, our localities who wanna take things a step further. Um, the other thing that I will, I will definitely talk about is um, um, two pieces of legislation that I think are, are critical. Um, Delegate Barron's MPI, MPIA legislation, Delegate Acevedo, who I'm sure will talk about it himself on Anton's law. I think it's really critical that we um, enable there to be transparency and a clarity of a time frame. As I said before, um, when it comes to the records um, that we can obtain over uh, on an officer, and transparency and clarity when we're looking in, into officers. You know, something that I've been wrestling with is. It's great if we put a lot of measures together when someone is killed and there's greater accountability. There's even a better rate of prosecuting officers criminally through a use of force statute. But I don't want anyone to be killed by law enforcement. So on the front hand, I do think we really have to look and I echo David, um, not David, um, Delegate Moon, uh, Subcommittee Chairman Moon about 
what kind of standard are we going to put in place for chiefs? What kind of standard are we going to put in place for um, the commission to have teeth for regular check-in with officers and like a regular auditing? If an officer is on the force with 18 complaints, whether they're sustained, unsustained, unfounded, under the ground, over the moon, that person should be having an automatic, almost like a ping for a check-in and revaluation of that person's record, what they're doing, having a supervisor right along with them. There has to be something that is clicking into effect for our sheriffs and our chiefs and for all the officers um, to be, oh, did I just, oh, to be held accountable. And then the last thing I'll talk about, which I know I think we all agree on, is also creating um, a duty um, to report misconduct and a duty um, to intervene when an officer is um, engaging in illegal um, and hurtful activities to our community. I think, you know, I, I know that Delegate Jackson and others who have spent more time either as law enforcement or with law enforcement um, than me can speak to this, but you know, even as colleagues ourselves, there's a culture that's created, right, in any group. And the culture within law enforcement, to me, um, has definitely been a blue wall of silence in a lot of ways. And there's a lot of great officers that risk their lives every day that do the right thing, who I'm proud of um, and grateful for. But they cannot be um, there to shine and recruit like-minded people when there when there's retaliation um, for pointing out officers that are doing the wrong thing. And I think we need to make something um, in, the, in not in statute and something that has um, ramifications if you do not do it. So that forces other officers to not just wanna go home and have the good reputation, but really um, keep an eye out for their department and each other. So I will leave it um, at that. I also think, uh, the one thing I'll also add that um, I have issues with the LEOBR is how um, the hearings are structured and the votes, um, on those boards. And so that also needs to be looked at. I think the public needs to have more of an input on hearing boards, um, an actual vote, um, and not, um, just designated from the sheriff to sit and serve. So I think all of those things that, um, as we go through, um, that statute and others, um, really breaking down how we can, um, make sure that the public is a part of the process. So that's it for me. Um, I'm really excited about what we're doing here. Um, and yeah, I think that that's gonna be um, a great place to start. Thank you, Delegate Fisher. Uh, next, Delegate Buckle. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you right. and we can see you. I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to learn learn Zoom, Vanessa, Del delegate out of It's very important, the Zooming. It's been um, hard. <laughs> I, I guess um, you know, I would take the position, uh, we've certainly heard a lot of well-meaning and good faith ideas and, and perspectives uh, so far and throughout our, I think you said earlier, 14 hours, you know. Seems like only yesterday, but it was 14 hours ago that we started this uh, Zoom process. Uh, and I, I want to say in the beginning, from, from my perspective, and I think um, representing or, or maybe being a voice for a lot of counties, certainly not the majority of the population, but probably the majority of the, the actual political subdivisions in our state uh, that, that blessedly don't, don't have maybe quite the same number of, of incidents and problems, or maybe have a different perspective in terms of uh, relationships with law enforcement, because in a lot of our communities, uh, a law enforcement officer isn't someone that we simply know seeing them riding a car in a, in a police car. They're people who we know personally uh, because of the size of some of our communities. So a lot of our law enforcement officers are people that uh, our kids play Little League Baseball together and, and people go to churches together and people grew up around each other and they're interrelated through marriages and, and uh, extended families. So I think in some of our communities, we have a little bit different take and different perspective on law enforcement because of those personal connections. Uh, what I'd like to say, this is a real issue. There's no question. It's a real issue. But I think it's important to get the details and the root causes right. I think sometimes there is a tendency, because it is such an important issue and it is so emotionally raw, 
and meaningful for people who've been affected by this. Uh, we listened to some of the testimony, uh, as Madam Chair pointed out, of individuals who had lost their loved ones in incidents involving police. Uh, I'm, as those of you, many of you on the call would know, I'm an attorney in real life. I, I've represented many people who have lost their loved one to someone else's negligence, uh, children, spouses, parents, brothers, sisters. And no matter what the situation is, that emotional wound lasts forever. And that desire to assign blame in many cases, and that desire to uh, seek some sense of justice to fill that void in your heart, in your soul, that's caused by the rending of your loved one being taken away in, in a moment, no matter what the circumstances, that desire sometimes, I don't know that it's going to produce the right public policy. Sometimes we have to divorce ourselves as policymakers and look at the facts. And my, my very good friend from Baltimore City who has devoted so much of his career uh, as a public servant to these issues, to, to the judicial issues, to police issues, to criminal law issues, mentioned something in the beginning of his remarks that was jarring to me. He said we had 20 deaths in, in last year, 20, 20 people killed by police in Maryland. And you know, I, I looked that up we may be dealing from different data sets. I just looked it up with Washington Post. I hope you don't tell any of my Republican constituents that I'm relying on the Washington Post for uh, my factual data, but I think they do a pretty damn good job, quite frankly, with those types of things. And what, I, what they seem to be saying is that in, in 2019, there were 19 deaths uh, from incidents with police in Maryland, but almost all of them involved incidents where the, uh, the individual who was killed had a weapon, whether they had a gun, whether they had a knife, whether they were driving a vehicle at or believed to be driving a vehicle at police or someone else. There appears to be only one situation that they've indicated in their review, their journalistic review of where a person of color was, was killed in an incident with police that was unarmed and there doesn't seem to be any rational inference that perhaps was dangerous or violent or had the capacity to harm the police or others. I think it's important to look at that uh, that one person, that's, that's a tragedy, that's a disaster. But if that's all, if that's what it is, if it is that one person, uh, then we have to look at what does that mean for public policy? I don't want to waste too much time. I won't go through everything on your list, Madam Chair, because I know you said next week uh, and these conversations will evolve for several weeks. But simply to, to respond in a way to some of what we've heard, I think body cameras is a wonderful opportunity for all of us to come together and come up with a compromise solution uh, that, that fits the needs of every stakeholder in this conversation. We need to get them funded, absolutely, the funding so that you can preserve the, uh, the footage, the funding so that officers have them, so that they're working. I appreciate my friend from Tacoma Park's remarks about how we, I didn't know that, that they're always recording and that they have a pre-record preset to them. That's an interesting issue that I think deserves a little bit more investigation of, of what's rational uh, and not, there's a lot of room to get those things compromised on. But the one thing that I don't wanna do, uh, I, I don't wanna get into a situation where we're creating evidentiary rules or legalistic rules that would allow for the release of actual criminals who are convicted by a jury of their peers. You know, sometimes body cam footage isn't everything. It's very important, but it's not everything in terms of a decision of guilt or innocence or culpability. I don't want people who really committed crimes in our communities to get off or to be released because of a technicality with the technology. All of us that have used Zoom or whatever we've used for the last seven months know this, right? Sometimes it doesn't work. Despite the best intentions of, of God and man, sometimes the technology just doesn't work. And I don't want to create anything that would allow loopholes for criminals because the technology doesn't work. Uh, turn to individual investigations or prosecution issue. I'm, I'm wary about that, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I can see the, the logic of saying, gee, you know, wh why would we let someone's own individual department investigate them? Isn't there a, a, a slight perception at a minimum of, of bias there? But I'm wary uh, because, you know, we heard concerns from perspectives as varied as conservative, small, rural county uh, elected sheriffs who said, hey, we don't want to do that. We think we can conduct these investigations. We heard very similar concerns from elected 
large urban jurisdiction Democratic state's attorneys, like from Baltimore City and Prince George's County, who said, we don't, we don't want you to take away any of our ability to control the investigation and the prosecution of police misconduct. We, we are elected to do that. We think we can do that. We're accountable. Sometimes I think as legislators, when we hear all those different scopes of the issue, different perspectives singing from the same hymnal, maybe we should step back for a minute and think there's something to that. Uh, but I, I'm interested in the conversation as it goes forward. I don't think I would be in favor of vesting that authority within the attorney general's office, because I think the attorney general's office inherently, just like our offices and even the elected sheriffs and state's attorneys is so inherently political uh, and is sometimes so divorced from just the straight practice of law that it would always lead to conflict and controversy. If we're going to do it, there are people within the state police, within the state prosecutors, there's other independent ways we could look at it, but I'm wary of that. Uh, next to finally, the use of force, the devil is in the details. Uh, the, the devil's in the details. If we want to have a use of force statute, rather than rely on case law, Supreme Court precedent as to what defines an officer can and can't do in a given situation, then we really, really have to workshop the heck out of that language through a legal framework from an officer's framework. Because I think I said this in response to one of the, the prior hearings, you can't legislate or micromanage a fight. You can't. When an individual, I don't know how many of you have been involved in physical fights. I've mentioned before, I've been involved, unfortunately, in, in, in a couple of, of situations where an individual had a knife or a weapon and was fighting and was hurting other people and might have hurt me. You can't legislate that and say, well, from 5,000 miles away five years ago, I said, you can't hit them with this, with this maneuver. You can't use that maneuver. Uh, that, that's illogical, and it's, it would create its own problems. But... What I am open to looking at is language that if we can create an objective standard, that's a key word, objective, with an objective officer when confronted with this situation or an objective human being, the heck with officer, confronted with this situation, would it have been reasonable for her or him to use the level of force that they used in this case? If the answer to that question is no, then that's excessive force. And that has its own panoply of penalties, administrative and potentially criminal. If the answer to that question is yes, if it was you or me or an objective person that believed that they were fighting in self-defense or to protect others, and given the physicalities of the people involved, if they would have done that maneuver or used that implement, then I, I don't think we can take that away from them from Annapolis, from on high. Uh, and finally, uh, again, you know, we got a lot of other issues to go through, but I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. With respect to the law enforcement officer's bill of rights, I have one very, uh, it's not meant to be flippant at all. I've already requested a bill. We've got to change the name of it. If we keep the, the bill, if we keep the concept, uh, the very fact that our forefathers and, and predecessors, I don't know, 40 years ago, whatever it was now, the very fact that they called it a bill of rights is, is problematic to people because language matters and people see this and we've heard it. I, I originally thought, why would anyone care what it's called? But people do, because the perception is, is that it, it changes the, the rights and the responsibilities uh, and the privileges that a police officer has that, that we wouldn't have in our Constitutional Bill of Rights. And you heard that from so many of these advocates that this is offensive to, to them to be called that. And I'm okay with that. So I already actually requested a bill on that, just to let you know, that we have to change that from a perception standpoint so people know what we're talking about. But what I'd urge us to do is to try to find common ground on improvements to that statutory scheme, which I think exists, which I think law enforcement leaders and, and rank and file police officers acknowledge exists. There, there are things that can be made better, can be made more transparent, can be made so that police are more accountable, so that citizens feel like they have more input into processes and more knowledge of things aren't just being, being swept under the rug uh, by a local police department. None of us want that. And so I think there are reforms there and some of them Delegate Anderson and others hinted at that can make a lot of sense. But I would urge us to not just go with the wholesale rejection of the concept because, you know, I was taught in law school once that the, the law of unintended consequences is absolute and brutal. And so sometimes things happen and you do things and for, for reason A, 
without fully seeing the, the iceberg underneath that, that you're going to hit. And I think if we were to wholly reject and just repeal LEOBR uh, immediately, in you know, it's October, session's coming in January, we've got COVID-19, we all know that this is an odd time in our, in our legislative work. I think if we were to do that without giving the time to build up a full system of whether it's collective bargaining, whether it's other statutory disciplinary procedures, whether it's case law that really says this is what you can and can't do absent LEOBR protections. If we just throw the baby out, the law of unintended consequences will be absolute and brutal. And so I hope that we consider that. Thank you. And I've enjoyed working with all of you and will again, I guess for another week or a month or however long Delegate Atterbury lets me. Thank you, Delegate Buckle. Now we're gonna move on to uh, Delegate Schlega. Then I'm gonna call on uh, Delegate Acevedo and then circle back to uh, Delegate Anderson, who I asked and you you did what I said. So thank you to hold off on LEOBR, but I know you you have some thoughts on that too. Um, so uh, Delegate Schlega. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair, for uh, hosting this and this good discussion that we're having. Um, body cameras, I'm going to kind of go down the list that you have here before us on the agenda. Um, are you talking about increasing funding to law enforcement, like bolstering that? Because I know Harper County specifically has uh, wanted to increase body camera availability for their officers, but the money just isn't there. Is, is that part of what we're talking about, Madam Chair? So I think our decision is going to have to be, or our recommendation, whether we say we should mandate body cameras or not mandate body cameras. And then as Delegate Fisher said, work with appropriations to figure out, you know, if there's any money for that or how, how that could happen. There is, I should let um, folks who don't know and folks who are listening in know that there is another work group that is specifically working on body camera issues and release of the footage of that of body cameras. Um, so I think for our purposes for this work group, yeah. the question is, should everybody have body cameras? And you know, I've gotten the same thing from Howard County out here. We, we don't have any money for it. Um, so that is something that I don't know that this particular work group is gonna figure out, but that's a that's an issue. Okay, and, and I would just you know chime in, if we're gonna mandate cameras, we better mandate some money to go with it because I think like Howard County, you know, other counties would have wanted to do this. And I'm glad to hear you have another work group working on body camera footage. Um, I was fortunate to attend the Baltimore County Police Training Academy. Um, they've invited everyone. I would urge all the members of this work group, if you haven't had an opportunity to do that, um, please do. I know Baltimore County would open their door to you. Um, but uh, one thing that I found quite interesting on the body camera footage issue was um, there was a specific instance where the, they said this, there's a man on the screen, you have a, a real uh, firearm, but it doesn't fire bullets. It's a, you know, fires virtual video, you know, bullets or something. Anyway, they said, uh, this man is going to shoot you. And we're going to tell you it's not a surprise. So you're standing there, the call comes in on the loudspeaker, and you know the guy's going to shoot you. Uh, by the time that one of our delegates picked up the firearm and shot him, he had turned and was running away. So, you know, the perception as Baltimore County uh, law enforcement said, hey, what do you think the media is going to show? police officer shoots guy in the back as he's running away. You know, so I, I, I want to make sure that we're also talking about interpretation of the video because, um, you know, certainly that was a real life, um, not a real life, that was a video of uh, what could have been a real life. And, and um, obviously it was defense and not aggression, you know, just shooting someone as they were quote running away. So um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm glad somebody's working on that very issue. Uh, mental health, uh, I think those are great ideas to expand opportunities for law enforcement. And I'm sure law enforcement would like that. But again, my question would be, are we, is the state going to provide psychiatrists or psychologists or, you know, especially to the smaller um, agencies that have a handful of officers? 
Um, I don't know the answer to that specific question. I'm sorry, I was looking at the chat. Uh, is the state going to provide? Well, that would, I would imagine the police departments would have to get those mental health professionals out of their budgets, out of their own operating budgets. Okay. All right. Um, you know, again, I would imagine if the state were willing to help fund that because we think it's a priority and we want to make sure that law enforcement officers are, you know, getting a, a mental health checkup, um, that if we could help provide that funding, I think it would be great. I would reiterate um, Delegate Buckle's concern about the AG's office being political. Um, you know, I'll just say Brian Frosch sues President Donald Trump any opportunity that he can. So, you know, that is clearly a political office and, and I understand where the work group's trying to get with that, but um, my opinion would be the AG's office may not be the best place. Um, and recruitment, I think you would hear every law enforcement um, agency across the state is struggling with recruitment. Um, Delegate Anderson, great idea to offer some kind of scholarships loan or loan repayment. Again, you know, those local law enforcement would come back to us and say, that's great. We love it. You know, how are we going to pay for it? So sounds like we need to increase funding for law enforcement. And I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, and then finally, I would just address um, Delegate Fisher talked about the quote, blue wall of silence. And, you know, I, I'd like to have our response is data driven. I don't know all the law enforcement agencies across the state clearly, but you know, of my two Baltimore and Harvard counties, and I would imagine others are very similar, of the complaints against officers, more than 50% are from other officers. So, you know, they are seeing a, a climate of officers willing to, you know, not abide by this, you know, so-called blue wall of silence. So, you know, let's make sure that that's not something that's already going on before we come in and, and make an assessment or, you know, as Delegate Buckle said, have the law of unintended consequences. So um, thank you again, Chairman Atterbury, for the opportunity to serve on the work group and um, look forward to hearing others' comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Schlega. I'm going to circle back to Delegate Anderson for comments that you might have. You're gonna skip Delegate Acevedo? Oh, you're right. Delegate Acevedo. And then we'll circle back to Delegate Anderson. Thank you. You might hear my daughter in the background answering her teacher, sorry. <laughs> All Hi, right. All right, thank you uh, very much, Madam Chair. Um, uh, let me just say it's been um, absolutely great working with uh, the folks on this work group um, and hearing the presentation from uh, all the stakeholders on this issue. Um, and I just wanted to uh, provide a couple of thoughts on uh, some areas that I believe we should be looking at as it relates to legislation. Um, and just going through your list, Madam Chair, um, I wanted to touch on decertification. Um, I know that uh, some states require a felony conviction for an officer to be decertified, whereas in other states, uh, an officer can be decertified over a non-criminal uh, personnel matter. Uh, and I think that is something that we should be looking at legislatively. Uh, is uh, the decertification of officers, both for um, uh, criminal felonies as well as for uh, personnel matters. Um, as we see it in many instances, um, uh, the, the lack of um, some kind of a statute that allows for that um, uh, creates a situation where problem cops then could then uh, fly under the radar and remain not just within law enforcement agencies, but then go to other law enforcement agencies um, uh, and causing similar problems. Uh, I also wanted to point, uh, um, uh, make a point about the body cameras because I know a number of my colleagues have uh, shared that this is important. And uh, while we certainly need to find out how we're gonna fund 
um, the uh, mandate that all uh, law enforcement officers should have uh, body cameras on them. Uh, I also want to point out that we have had a number of instances of police brutality captured on body camera footage. Uh, in the case of Eric Garner, in the case of Tamir Rice, uh, or in the case of Richard Brooks, there are so many instances where um, uh, cases of police brutality are documented on footage and this sort of uh, mindset that, you know, uh, well, as long as we have body camera footage, then that will somehow uh, deal with the issue of police violence or police brutality. And I think it's important for us to not only have body camera footage, but there also needs to be strengthening of the law that says if an officer or officers were to tamper with their body cameras or to switch it off, as we've seen in many cases, not just across this state, but this country where police officers either switch off their body cameras or they're instructed to switch off their body cameras uh, by uh, their fellow officers. And I think there needs to be some kind of an implication. Uh, there needs to be some kind of a disciplinary action, whether it's at the department level or criminally for um, officers who tamper with uh, and switch off their body cameras, because what in essence you're doing uh, is tampering with potential evidence that can have uh, a really big impact on uh, a case that they may be involved in in the future. Um, I also want to echo the comments of Delegate Anderson and uh, Delegate Fisher that we need a statewide use of force statute. Uh, I think that is critical because it not only sets a standard, but it also provides prosecutors with uh, the bandwidth, so to speak, uh, that if an officer were to use uh, uh, excessive or deadly force uh, when it does not meet this standard or it is not uh, warranted or justified that there are criminal implications, meaning that state's attorneys or, or the attorney general, and I know we're discussing uh, where that prosecutorial power will rest, but I do think that we need to provide that kind of a ban within the law that uh, would allow for um, uh, the bringing of charges um, uh, by prosecutors for officers that do use excessive or deadly force when it isn't warranted or justified. Um, I also want to uh, touch on um, real quickly uh, police settlements. Uh, I think there needs to be some kind of a legislation requiring that all jurisdictions in Maryland uh, 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 get insurance because what we do, uh, what we know is that some jurisdictions have a legit program or the local government insurance trust that covers uh, uh, suits uh, brought uh, in cases of excessive force, brutalization, uh, wrong, um, uh, uh, death, et cetera. Um, and I think there needs to be a requirement that all jurisdictions have insurance, whether you're a county, a municipality, however large, however small, you need to have insurance um, and that needs to be a mandate. Um, because what we see is that if the uh, jurisdictions don't have insurance, then that is being paid out of general or operating budget. So in other words, we, the taxpayers, are then left holding the bag for the actions uh, of problem cops. Um, and I don't think that is, um, uh, that is something that, that, that is a good model to be moving forward with. Um, I also want to uh, touch uh, really quickly um, on uh, legislation that I have introduced, um, Anton's Law, named for Anton Black, the 19-year-old uh, college athlete that was killed in police custody on the Eastern Shore. Um, and the reason why I continue to bring up his case, because I think uh, that um, there needs to be there needs to be legislation to address the inadequacy in state laws that his death showed, um, whether it's around decertification, um, whether it's around uh, transparency. We saw uh, where the community and the family was asking for information and they did not receive it for months until uh, 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 you know, the community as well as Governor Hogan had demanded that that information be released. So I think we need to be looking at the Maryland Public Information Act and reforming it so that complainants can receive a copy of the investigative file uh, upon conclusion of investigation. But equally as important that police misconduct records 
uh, or sustained and unsustained complaints are something that also uh, uh, can be public because when we look at uh, uh, police and, and sheriff's departments investigating themselves, uh, it is no surprise that a, more, um, that a majority of these uh, complaints that are filed come up as unsustained or having no merit. Um, and I think it's important in order for us to root out problem cops that we're reforming the MPIA uh, so that complainants are getting a copy of the investigative file as well as uh, sustained as well as unsustained complaints. Um, uh, I do think as far as the LEOBR, the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, uh, that we should be looking at uh, the repeal of a fundamentally flawed law. Uh, and I heard earlier uh, that, you know, one of my colleagues, uh, Delegate Buckle, I believe, that was saying that, you know, uh, we need to change the name of the law. Uh, and changing the name of a fundamentally flawed law doesn't address the problems that exist within that law that provides procedural protections to law enforcement officers that you and I as ordinary citizens do not have. So in essence, what we're attempting to do is put lipstick on a pig and say we have resolved the issue when in actuality what we should be doing is repealing a law that provides procedural protections, impedes accountability, uh, and does not allow communities to have oversight over their law enforcement agencies. So I think we need to look at that. And I think that there are other states, and, and, and this is not um, uh, and, and, and I want to just push back a little bit on this, you know, the sky is falling if we were to repeal the LEOBR because a number of other states uh, uh, and jurisdictions do not have a law enforcement officer's bill of rights. What we have the opportunity here is to figure out what kind of a process that we want and removing impediments to building trust between communities and law enforcement that serves them. And the LEOBR is not the only, but the biggest impediment to that. And we shouldn't be trying to put lipstick on a pig and change the name of a fundamentally flawed law, but repeal it, understanding that it would empower our communities and allow for greater trust and transparency. Uh, I also wanna just uh, touch really quickly on uh, use of force, which is included in Anton's law. Anton's law addresses the Maryland Public Information Act. It addresses the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, but it uh, also uh, provides for a statewide use of force standard. Um, and I think that is the right direction that we need to be heading in, if that means having a discussion on how we build on Anton's law or improve it. Um, but I do think we need to be looking at those areas um, in particular. Uh, and just lastly, um, because it was mentioned, and I think uh, uh, it's, it's something that we need to push back on because it's particularly dangerous that somehow uh, in cases of police or interactions with law enforcement, if the suspect or victim was armed, that he, she, or they uh, somehow, um, uh, uh, you know, were deserving of uh, uh, whether it's death or brutality or et cetera, et cetera, and I just wanna make clear that there is, and there shouldn't be, um, well rather the, the punishment for being armed is and should not be a death sentence. If we're talking about the second amendment's rights and the right for people to bear arms, uh, and if you are armed, that is not a cause or a grounds uh, for someone extrajudicially executing you without you having a day in court. And as we've seen in cases of police uh, killings, you have had some victims who were, um, uh, uh, had the proper licensing uh, to carry um, and were even members of the NRA, as we saw in the case of, uh, I believe, Philando Castillo, who was um, licensed to carry. And so this idea that somehow if an, uh, a, a suspect was armed or someone here that they were armed, that somehow the case is closed, uh, the, deaths, the, 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 the punishment for being armed is not and should not be a death sentence. Um, and so we have to push back on this kind of, a, you know, in, in my opinion, this, this uh, dangerous mindset that somehow if someone is armed and then the police or law enforcement uh, is justified in whatever force they use 
Uh, and um, we've seen in many cases where people have been armed uh, and law enforcement has uh, uh, exemplified discretion, right, with certain people. But when it comes to others, uh, we see a certain force that is used disproportionately. Uh, so I think it's really important that we look at all those areas. But uh, as I mentioned, um, the bill that I introduced, Anton's Law, um, touches on the Maryland Public Information Act, the LEOBR, as well as use of force. Uh, but I do believe there are other connecting issues that we need to look at, particularly around decertification, um, making sure that there is some kind of a, of, of a disciplinary action or, or criminal implications for officers that tamper with or switch off their body cameras. That has to be clear in the law. Um, and uh, police settlements requirement that all jurisdictions in Maryland uh, have uh, insurance uh, to be covering this and that taxpayers are not, not left holding the bag uh, with these police settlements as we see in the case of Prince George's County um, in Baltimore City and Baltimore County and in, in other places across uh, the country, that has to be a requirement. Um, and with that, um, Yes, uh, uh, and, and, and lastly, I know it's not uh, uh, something that we've touched on with the group, but um, I do think something that's related is the issue uh, of police in schools. And to quote my uh, colleague, Delegate Schleiger, that we need to be looking at the data, uh, and I would completely agree with her. And if we were to look at the CRDC, the Civil Rights Data Collection released by the Department of Education, we would see that the presence of law enforcement in schools disproportionately impacts Black, Latinx, and students with disabilities. Um, it leads to the school to prison pipeline and a number of issues. And in my own county alone, where Black students account for a fifth of enrollment in Montgomery County public schools, they account for over half of all arrests. So we have to start talking about police in schools, looking at the data and legislating to ensure that we're protecting our babies. With that, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to weigh in and, and, and thank you all for the work that uh, you're doing here. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Acevedo. Now, Delegate Anderson and then Delegate Sample Hughes. Uh, thank you again, Madam Chair. Uh, one of the things I have to, I guess I have to respond to is my good friend, uh, Delegate Buckle, uh, indicated that uh, where he lives in his county, um, you know, his uh, police intermarry with members of the community. They play ball with members of the community. They're, they're friends of the community. That's pretty much the case all over the state. I, I don't think that there are, very, there are very few people, at least legislators here, who don't believe that uh, the police are essential, they're our friends, and that we want to work with the police. Uh, for 10 years, I was the uh, president of a little league, uh, Northwood Little League, which is exactly across the street from the police station. And we'd have police officers come and, and work with the kids, coach the kids. And most kids have good impressions of police officers. That is not what this work group is about. It's about the discipline of officers who aren't that 99%. The 1% of police officers who unfortunately don't understand why they're a police officer, maybe have mental health problems, maybe they're afraid for their lives for unreasonable reasons, uh, but we've got to make sure that we have rules to cover everybody. And um, that 1%, you know, Buckle, I have represented folks on the Eastern Shore as well, Dorchester, Queen Anne's, Caroline County, where police officers have used uh, excessive force in those counties as well. Anton Black, as Delegate Acevedo says, from the Eastern, was from the Eastern Shore. So let me just say that uh, I don't think any of us on this subcommittee or this work group um, are out to get the police. Uh, what we're trying to do is to protect our citizens from those rogue police, that 1% of police officers who don't follow the rules. Anyway, my speech is over. Just want to um, go back to the, uh, the repeal of the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. And in order to understand where we're coming from, the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights is simply that. It's a Bill of Rights for officers uh, who have been accused or who are facing disciplinary action. 
It doesn't give them any extra rights any place else. It's just that when the chief the sheriff or the commissioner says, you're going to get 30 days to wreck in that patrol car. The police officer then has the ability to either accept that discipline or decide, uh, I don't want to accept it. I want to go, uh, I want to assume my rights under the law enforcement officer's bill of rights and have a trial board. And in the trial board, he gets a certain amount of time to get a lawyer. Uh, the uh, police department has a certain amount of time to finish the investigation. The officer has a certain number of days uh, to get his case ready. If he doesn't like the decision of the trial board, he has a certain number of days uh, to file an appeal. Uh, those are all administrative remedies because of due process, process of law in our constitution. Every citizen in the state of Maryland, or at least every employee in the state of Maryland has exactly those same rights, but we don't call it the, you know, the trash collector's bill of rights, or we don't call it the, um, the accountant's bill of rights. It's basically in the state and personnel article, title 11 under disciplinary action. And the virtually the same type of rights that exist for officers under the LAOBR already exist in title 11 of the state personnel article. You have a time, you have time to, uh, anybody who wants to discipline you has to do it within a certain period of time. I think it's 45 days. If you don't like the discipline, you can appeal it. In some cases to your secretary, or in some cases to the Office of Administrative Hearings. You have 30 days to file that. Once they render their, their decision, if you don't like their decision, you can file an appeal uh, to the, uh, the circuit court in which this action occurred. And in many cases, if you don't like what the circuit court says, you can file an appeal to the Court of Special Appeals. So um, to say that, um, you know, that there needs to be a separate law enforcement officer's bill of rights for police officers, uh, I think is not, you, you, heard the, you heard the chiefs and sheriffs talk about it. He said, this is just for administrative purposes. So if we got rid of the LEOBR, the big question is what do we replace it with? Well, the replacement product is already there. Now I'll admit that there has to be some, uh, some tweaks so it reflects police officers, but the bottom line is the same process, the same rights that uh, the average state employee has should be the same rights that police officers have uh, who are accused of or are facing disciplinary action. And let me get this straight. This is only for officers facing disciplinary action. If an officer has committed a crime, a felony, uh, the police chief already has and still has the right to remove him in many cases, if uh, the person, I mean, if he's committed, if he's convicted. And um, if there's a, a situation where a police officer is accused uh, or is involved with a, a, a murder, somehow someone dies as a result of the interaction with the police, that wouldn't even fall, fall, fall under uh, administrative actions. It would go straight to the special prosecutor, the state's attorney, uh, the, the attorney general, whoever's going to be doing it. So in terms of uh, the law enforcement officer's bill of rights, I think, uh, Delegate Acevedo, we're not going to put lipstick on this pig, okay? We're just going to get a different pig. <laughs> if you, if, if that's, a, that's probably a poor choice of words. But, uh, <laughs> um, but, before, but back to what Delegate Fisher said, uh, take a look, uh, Delegate Fisher, at Title 11 State Personnel and Pensions, and um, you'll see the specific time frames for each stage of the hearings, whether it's the investigation, whether it's time frame for filing complaints, or whether it's the time frame for filing, uh, filing appeals. I think that we can sit down and make sure that uh, what exists in state law now under Title 11 um, will fit for police officers as well. And Delegate Atterbury, I looked at the question that you raised, will this create 146 different standards of discipline around the state uh, for police officers? And I think that when we look at this, the one common denominator is that there is a chief 
there is a sheriff, there is a commissioner who is ultimately responsible for making the decision. And they can actually set up trial boards under um, Title 11 if they want. But the bottom line is that it's still going to be a, pro a uniform process across the state. So uh, thank you very much for that, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate Anderson. And now we're going to hear from our Speaker Pro Tem, uh, Delegate Sample Hughes, and then Delegate Rosenberg has some comments. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you um, all today again for being on this work group. Um, it certainly has been um, insightful for me, particularly not being in the uh, committee of jurisdiction that has a lot of this uh, conversation on a daily basis. Um, so therefore it's really been eye-opening and um, I've heard from constituents throughout the district and beyond. Um, I wanted to just highlight just a few things on the list. Um, I would just start off by saying, you know, with accountability, accountability in particular, I believe that that resonates and that's the foundation of all that what we are trying to accomplish on all those bullet points up there today. Um, with regards to um, the Maryland Training Standards Commission, I think when we heard from them, um, I first immediately thought that they need some more teeth. Um, and what that looks like, uh, certainly that's continued dialogue that we're gonna have. Um, but when I heard specifically from the representatives, you know, talk about um, things that they tried to put in place and that um, law enforcement agencies can um, be somewhat reprimanded, but not truly reprimanded if in fact they did not follow through on some of the things that were being proposed, i.e. Uh, community policing plan and some other things. And I wanted to say that I think that if we're going to have this um, they need some more tools. They need some more um, tools in the sense of being able to hold uh, law enforcement uh, departments accountable. Um, and so we can realize those laws that we have put in place and those policies that we put in place can really truly um, come to fruition and really be action oriented within the community. Um, with regards to the community oversight, um, I know that we had uh, you know, enabling legislation um, for that to occur. But once again, our citizens are not really and truly aware of that. So my recommendation, and I've shared this with the chair, is that um, we have the vehicle of the um, municipal, Maryland Municipal League, as well as the Maryland Association of Counties, um, to be able to reiterate that this is available and get this out there to the public and then really see the follow through um, within those uh, municipalities and within the county governments because our citizens should be aware of it. I believe that there should and can be uh, community oversight. Um, De-escalation training, one that to me is extremely important. It's very important for me um, because, you know, I hear from the law enforcement agencies talk about that they have some best practices and, um, you know, things that they're looking at, national best practices, and then it goes back to, you know, funding. How do we do that? Well, yes, funding is a concern and we need to figure that piece out. But what is concerning to me is that if we don't have uh, a standard or if we don't have uh, proper training in that area, it is a very pivotal moment for law enforcement um, and the citizen because it could be a matter of a citizen walking away, driving away, or being picked up, from a, picked up by a coroner um, if this situation doesn't go right. So that pivotal moment of when something can be uh, a positive interaction with law enforcement or a negative interaction can be, um, I believe, um, curtailed or at least helped in some standard fashion through proper de-escalation training. And we need to have a standard on that. Um, I guess I am in favor of the body cameras. Um, and I do certainly believe that, yes, there are um, times where interpretation and, and additional um, delving into the, the footage is necessary. And that's why we have, um, you know, people and should be, be able to look at that a little bit deeper. But again, we can't have um, some areas of the state equipped, literally, with the equipment to have body cameras and others not so much. Yes, again, that's a funding issue and it very much needs to be put in place because I think that and across the nation, 
we have had our eyes open through body footage cameras and be able to look and see what has occurred. Because otherwise, you know, truly um, some cases would not have been solved. And the mere fact that may not have intentionally have been solved um, through not having the access. Um, I have a better appreciation for independent um, entity looking into cases. I had an issue um, in the district and it was brought to my attention by the citizens um, that they had concerns with um, law enforcement entity in the district. Um, and they didn't know who to turn to. So I you know, spoke with them and they wanted to ensure that their safety and the fear that they have um, is validated, but they wanted to talk to an independent agency. Um, while in this particular situation, no one has been charged with, no officer has been charged with anything or that nature, but I felt as though I needed to find that independent source. So I did go to the attorney general. So just try to get some insight, what can be done and how this citizen um, and his daughter and his love, other loved ones could get that voice and get that, that, that moment to be able to be heard and to see if there needs to be a further investigation. Um, so to that end, um, I, I think it's necessary. The last couple of things I'll mention is that mental health. Mental health, I believe, is extremely important. Um, our officers see so much. Uh, case in point, just uh, this past week and on the Eastern Shore, there was about 200 more arrests that occurred in Worcester County um, due to uh, the, the event, H2I event that comes down. But just the mere fact that the level of aggression that has been um, uh, been a part of their daily work, um, there needs to be at least at some point some pivotal um, assessment that can be done. Um, in Somerset County last week, we had an officer that discovered, um, unfortunately, his loved one uh, hung himself and he, you know, went to the scene as in his law enforcement capacity, but certainly there's got to be some level of assessment as these officers are seeing a lot, um, having to deal with a lot. So we really need to look at how and when it is appropriate for them to have appropriate um, assessments to take place. And the last thing I'll say is that I do agree with uh, my colleague uh, with regards to incentivizing the recruitment process. Um, I like that that framework that you know the military has used, and it certainly has bode well for people to be able to get their education, give back to the community, and really be um, be be truly in the trenches with what they um, they love doing. And so, I think that this certainly could be a, a positive look in the um, world of law enforcement, and to be able to diversify it at its given time. Um, and in closing, um, you know, a lot of these things that we're found um, that we have discussed and are discussing um, is certainly true indeed and need to be realized um, for the state of Maryland. And the mere fact that we have seen a lot of these policies in um, uh, Anton's law, because that's near and dear to my heart. I met their family and I know that like, Severo brought it up earlier, but a lot of these things are within that proposal. Um, and we need to really look at those with a keen eye. Um, and so we can have that true accountability across the network. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker Pro Tem. And now Delegate Rosenberg, then Delegate McComas, and finally Delegate Davis. So Delegate Rosenberg. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, several points uh, really following up at this point on what some others, uh, some of my co our colleagues have said. Mr. Rosenberg, it's Debbie from Sacramento. Sorry, getting a message. Um, first on uh, an officer's duty to intervene. I would agree with Delegate Fisher that that should be uh, included in what in our work product. Uh, it could have been of real benefit uh, for George Floyd because there were other officers there uh, when the one officer had his foot on his neck. Uh, so that as an example, uh, and there is precedent for that, either in perhaps in the uh, consent decree with the Baltimore City Police Department, there may be a duty to intervene. Uh, mental health, uh, I agree that uh, examining who should uh, handle that, whether it should be some you know, social work or mental health uh, trained individual instead of the police, that that would be uh, preferable. 
uh, and I'm glad to see that that is on our agenda. Uh, recruiting, yes, there is an existing excellent idea from Delegate Anderson. There's an existing uh, loan assistance repayment program that we have in the state. And um, this would be, a, we could build on that program. It's the Janet Hoffman Loan Assistance Repro Re Loan Assistance Repayment Program. And finally, um, moving LEOBR or the treatment of the police uh, to S Article 11 would be following Supreme Court precedent because we there's cases saying that both civilian st st government employees as well as police government employees are entitled to due process protections. I assume they're similar, if not identical. So I think there it would be appropriate uh, to do that in our, in the existing law in Article 11. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Rosenberg. Uh, Delegate McComas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just briefly, uh, I wanted to make a couple comments because um, I know we had spoken earlier. Um, regarding the LEOBR, um, I think that and just maybe say, okay, we'll switch it to Article 11 in this um, public employees. The concern is, is that um, police officers deal with um, deadly force weapons. They deal with people that are, um, can be very violent. And I think that if you can be killed, um, that kind of changes the dynamic than if you're going to be killed if you're, um, you know, a clerk in a government office or you're even in public works. And public works is certainly a little more dangerous than um, being a clerk. So I think that whatever we do with the LEOBR, um, I think we have to make sure that we, we provide sufficient protections for the police and there will have to be exceptions to Article 11. We can't just say, okay, the police are going to get moved into Article 11. Um, the issue regarding body cameras, and um, I think that Delegate Shalega hit the nail on the head that there needs to be the money, but I will say that uh, sometimes I look at some of the, the body camera things that have been in other, you know, on the news and everything, and sometimes it's very confusing as to what happened because you just see all this, you know, moving around and struggling and everything, and I can't figure out who's on first and who's on second, so I'm not sure that they're the um, end-all, be-all of everything. Now, regarding the independent investigations, um, I think that um, internal affairs a lot of times has been the investigator, and usually, I think it's kind of common knowledge that the police, the regular police who are not part of internal affairs are scared to death of internal affairs. Um, so I, do we have a situation where if internal affairs is aware of something that they aren't investigating, I, have they proven to be incompetent? I, I don't believe that's so, but I don't know for a fact. So that might be something we might wanna um, get more information on. Um, Regarding independent prosecutions, I, I, I agree that the AG's office is probably not the, the proper venue. I don't necessarily think the state prosecutor, as suggested by our colleagues over in the Senate, is a good option. I think we really need to think long and hard how that's dealt with. Um, mental health, I just want to say that that is very crucial and important, both for mental health, dealing with the folks that need help on the street that the police have to interact, but also for the police. And I know that um, several years ago, I put in a bill as well as uh, Delegate uh, Hidalgo Frazier regarding um, getting um, immunity so that there could be critical incident peer on peer uh, counseling. And of course the trial lawyers came in and, and uh, pitched a fit and said, oh, we, you know, you can't have, we, they fight immunities. I mean, that's just kind of their second nature. So the bills went down in flames, but I really think that that is needed because peer-to-peer -peer counseling and support is important. And a lot of times the best, you know, it's like how Alcoholics Anonymous works, it's how Narcotics Anonymous works, that that is very, very important. And I think that that would be very helpful. Um, so then the other, the other issue is, um, Use of force. Um, I, I know in one of the persons that um, they had been tased by the police. This was, I believe, in uh, Wisconsin. 
or or Illinois, I forget where it was. And then uh, he he was he was uh, fell asleep in the drive-through at Wendy's, and um, things went well. And then everything kind of went south. And then he ran away. I I don't think, in other words, they could have got the guy because they knew who he was. So so it just seems to me that they could have just picked him up at at his residence or where he was going, where he was running to, and they didn't need to shoot him. So I think that you know. Basically, if there's another way to get a person and you don't have to, to um, there doesn't have to be that violent pursuit of, of shooting them literally in the back, I think we need to look at those kind of incidents and have people kind of think a little bit outside the box that you don't need to get him right at that, at that moment. Um, so I, but I do think that uh, Delegate Buckle's comment um, really resonates with me that we all need to be prepared um, to deal with the unintended consequences. And basically, I think it's very, very important that we realize that whatever we do here, we've got to make sure that we are moving the ball forward to have people decide they want to be police and we're not driving people out of uh, police and enforcement because I think that whatever we do, if we create it, making it very difficult that these police officers don't have, no one has their back, whether it be the prosecutors or their, or because we've made such a high bar. Um, I think the idea is public safety and safety of those that are on the street and that also interact with the police. And then the other thing I think is very, very necessary is that police need to realize that they need to take control of the situation, but sometimes you don't need force. You don't need to take control of the situation. Sometimes if you just kind of listen and you back up and you try to be polite, and even if somebody swears at you, spits in your face or whatever, it doesn't mean that you have to get physical with them. Um, there was a judge in Baltimore City who used to say, I don't care if the defendant after I sent him to prison calls me a rotten SOB, um, the worst thing in the world, because quite honestly, he had, that's his right. Now, I'm not saying that police have to do that, but I think that there has to be a little bit of tolerance and um, for them when they approach the public. If, if in other words, it's kind of like a dance. If, if the person gets a little snarky, if the police get snarky, it just escalates. So that's my suggestions, and, and I thank you, Madam Chair, for, for uh, allowing me to kind of express some of my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate McComas. And last but definitely not least, Delegate Deb Davis. Mm -hmm. There you go, you're on, you should be on. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there is not a lot that I'd like to add at this point, but I would like to just um, weigh in um, on my support of a use of force statute, also with um, total repeal of LEOBR, and of course, um, a, a strong MPIA statute. We really need that. And I'd like to base it all on the theme of accountability and transparency. Several of my colleagues had mentioned that some of the laws that we've already passed were good laws, in the respect that they address the situations, but they didn't include accountability. And so I, I, um, I, I ask all of my colleagues to make sure that whatever we pass, whatever we put forth, whatever recommendations that we make, that there is strict accountability in it. If not, it's just paper, pen and paper. Um, and Delegate Moon mentioned, you know, the, the, in the courts and even financial um, accountability is, is really important. I'd like to add something that hasn't been mentioned, and that is regarding a statewide database of complaints. We need that. We need that totally statewide, even um, what's the word, founded or unfounded complaints. We need a statewide database. Um, and if you don't comply, there needs to be accountability. There needs to be some um, financial ramifications if you don't comply. Um, I also, one of my colleagues also mentioned about how the, you know, police officers, a member of the community and, and all that family stuff. But not all of us are, um, are policed by people that look like us, people who even live in our community. And on that note, I, 
I would like to propose that there be some um, some expectation that, that police officers live in our communities and maybe um, incentive for, um, for hiring police officers from the community. Um, and just lastly, I just like to say that all Marylanders demand and deserve humane policing. And you know, when I sit here, I think about, it looks like the tale of two Marylands. Marylands. Uh, it, it seems as though, you know, it, some communities understand it and feel it and can't sleep at night. And some communities want to explain it away. I can't explain it. Um, I don't understand it, but I do know that the citizens in Maryland and across the country are demanding um, humane policing and demanding action. And we have no choice but to give it to them. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Davis. And thank you to the members uh, of the work group for all of your comments uh, today and your, your thoughtful comments. Um, as we move forward, we have um, significant work to do. So our net that concludes today's uh, meeting. We will meet Thursday of next week on October 8th at 1 p.m. And I would be prepared for a longer meeting and I would like to see all of your lovely faces. So thank you, uh, have a good week and I will see you next week.